Okay, let's see if you remember how to do this one. So, we have the formula BMI is equal to W over H squared times 703. We have to replace each of the number or each of the letters with the number they represent. So, we're looking for BMI. W, the weight, is 160. H is 70, so it's going to be 70 squared times 703. So I'm just going to punch this in the calculator. We can actually type it in just like it is there. 160 divided by 70 squared and then times 703. So 22.96 basically is the body mass index. That's something that's relatively important. Um, in pretty much any field you go into is being able to put numbers into a formula like that. Um, the solving equations that we did is maybe not quite as important. That's more of a thought process than it is a, an actual skill. Although we do have the, the uh, solutions mixings that we did last time. Before we get too far into our new measurement, let's uh, review one of those from last time. Let's say you have... 40% and 60% solution. Then you need 45% solution. So the question is how much 60% do you need to mix? 120 milliliters of 45% in order to achieve, or 45 cents, sorry, 40% to achieve your 45%. So I'm going to pause this here and I'm going to let you guys try that for a second. See if you can set that up. We've got 40% combined with 60%, trying to get 45%. So what we're combining here, we have the 40%. Combining it with the 60%, try to get a result of 45%. So we can convert those to decimals to have our concentrations. Do the, which amounts do we know? What amount do we know at this point? 120 milliliters of the 40%. So I'm going to let X be the amount of the 60%. So how much 45% do I have? I have to add those two amounts together, either 120 plus x or x plus 120. So from there, it's a matter of setting up the formula. Concentration times the volume or amount. 40% is 0.4 times 120 plus 60% is 0.6 times x is its amount. That has to equal the amount of the result, which is going to be 45%, which is 0.45, times that amount is x plus 120. 0.4 times 120 is 48, plus 0.6x. 0.45 times x is 0.45x. 0.45 times 120 is, what, 54? How many of you made it to that point? Got the formula down. Okay, that's the tough part. Now from here, it's a matter of solving the equation. X appears twice, once on each side of the equation, so we have to get rid of one. We'll get rid of the smaller one, the 0.45. So we have 48 over here yet. 0.6 minus 0.45 is 0.15x equals, all that's left over here is 54. Then we'll subtract the 48. So 0.15x equals 6. 
And finally, divide by 0.15. X equals 40. So if we go back up here, X is the amount of the 60%. 40 milliliters of the 60%. How many of you are starting to feel comfortable with those problems, the mixture problems? Okay, about half. <laughs> they are kind of a, the, the key is just being able to get from the words into that equation. But the only way to get good at it is practice. For the test next week, um, usually when I do the test, I only put one or two of those on there just so you know. Just because of the time it takes to do them. Also, for the, the, the test is next week for Unit 2, just a reminder. Um, the plan usually is to take about the first hour to hour and 15 minutes for the test. And then we do try to lecture at least a half an hour to 40 minute lecture to begin Unit 3 after the test. We'll play it by ear and see how it's going. Okay, so today we do have to wrap up Unit 2. And Unit 2's main topic is on measurement, so we're going to get into the measurement today and some of the measurements. Measurement came from a need to communicate. And we'll talk a little bit about length measurement first, just because that's the easiest one to, to show visually. Um, if we're in a room and we're trying to make something that's the same size, let's say we're copying this sheet of paper. I, if we're in the same room, I just hold it up and say, hey, it's this big. Or you can walk over with what you're doing and put it next to it and, and mark it off and we get them the same size. But if you're across town or even down the hall and I need to communicate with you somehow what size that is, well, maybe I'll take my pen and I'll go, okay, it's one, two, about two and a half pens long. Well, so then I send that message to you and you, you go, okay, that's fine. I go, one, two, well, two and a half of your pens is much longer than that. So when I send that message to you, I'm making two big assumptions. One is I'm assuming that you have a pen. And two, that if you have a pen, I'm assuming they're the same size. You know, here we can see a, a drastic difference in size between the two pens. That would make a big difference. So what they did was they chose things that one, pretty much everybody had. And two, that were pretty close to the same size from one person to another. And the first thing that was really used was body parts. Like for length, an inch was the distance from the end of the thumb to the point of the first knuckle. And you use that to measure length. Obviously, you've heard of a foot. You know, the foot was from the back of your heel to the tip of your big toe. Now, we use a foot for measuring a lot of things, but at that time, it was only used for measuring things along the ground because, well, that's where your foot is. If I wanted to measure the height of this wall here, I'm going to get to about here if I stretch really well, but there's no way I'm measuring all the way to the ceiling with my foot. And not unless I chop it off at the ankle or something, right? So they had other units of measure because you, d you couldn't detach a body part to measure in awkward places for measuring heights. And those have ex become extinct now that we've developed standardized measurement and measuring systems. Actually, it was King Edward in the 500s who declared that his thumb and his foot and his yard and everything else were going to be the official measurements of the land. And it was a very selfish act on his part, egotistical on his part, but it was a huge step in advancing measurement because now they came in and they took his thumb and they just put a piece of wood there and marked it off and they cut a bunch of pieces of wood and passed them out for people to use. Well, now you didn't have to be able to get your th thumb in there to measure it. You just had that piece of wood that you used. And the same with the, the foot. So now they didn't need hands and cubits and other units of measure. They could use that little stick that was a foot long to measure the height of the wall. So it, it, And actually then that developed into our first rulers from that. So anyway, length measurements for us are really not that important. So we're going to start talking about other units first. And we're going we're gonna to talk about standard units. And to start off our discussion of units, we're going to talk about weight and mass. And before we talk about those units, we discuss what is the difference between weight and mass. 
And there is a very, very important difference. Weight is the measurement of the force of gravity on an object. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. If you think, you know, from your chemistry, you know, it's literally how many particles are within that object. And you might look at that and say, well, isn't that pretty much the same thing? They're very, very, very similar. The, the amount, the force of gravity on an object depends on the amount of mass. I mean, the more mass is in there, the more force gravity is going to have on it. But the difference is in the way they're measured. Weight is measured with a scale. And what a, all a scale is, is it's a spring. We hang our object we're trying to weigh on it. And then they put the scale portion is actually just a meter that hangs on it has an indicator attached to that spring and then it's a numbered scale literally down the scale so as the spring stretches the number moves so when we hang that object on there that spring stretches out and that indicator moves as the spring stretches and that's the, the amount the spring stretches turn, tells us the weight of that object Mass is measured using a balance. So this is a scale. And a lot of people refer to a balance as a scale, but it's not. A balance is literally like a teeter-totter almost. Um, you put the object you're trying to measure on one side, and then you put known masses on the other until it balances. So whatever mass is on this side that balances our object, that's the same mass as our object we're trying to measure. All right, look at that. So well, what, what's the difference? Well, the difference is if I go somewhere where gravity is less or more than it is now, this is still going to balance. Because, yeah, the, the amount of gravity on our object is going to change, but the amount of gravity on our known mass is going to change too. So they're still going to balance. Over here, however, if we go to like the moon where there's less gravity, it's going to pull less. So because it pulls less, that spring's going to stretch out less, and it'll have less weight. So you change the gravity, you change the weight. On Earth, gravity is relatively constant. Um, it is slightly less at the equator and slightly more at the north and south poles. But it's close enough that it doesn't change much that we would kind of consider it to be a constant. Because of that on Earth we kind of get sloppy moving back and forth between mass and weight. So we'll refer to weight and we'll actually use a mass unit. Um, in the standard system, we use pounds and, and stuff like that. That is weight. And we're going to go over those units of weight here in just a minute, the rest of the units of weight in just a minute. There are units for mass in the standard system. Most people have never heard of them. The main unit of mass in the standard system is called a slug. One pound of weight, or sorry, one slug weighs 16 pounds. So not terribly convenient to work with. 
Now, for our purposes, that's not something that's ever going to be on a test. You don't have to know about slugs. You don't have to know about the standard units of mass. But you do, it's, it's important to realize that there is a difference between mass and weight. So when we're talking about standard units, we're going to be focusing on units of weight. When we get to metric units, however, in the metric system, they tend to focus on mass. So we're going to be doing conversions between standard and metric. We're going to be getting a little sloppy. We're actually going to be converting standard weight into metric mass. So anyway, let's look at our standard weight, standard units of weight. So our standard units of weight, we'll start out with the largest one and we'll work our way down. The largest unit that we use tends to be a ton. A ton was actually originally used for buying and selling grain. Can anybody tell me how many pounds are in a ton? 2,000 pounds in a ton. Now, everything we do, if we see a ton listed, it's going to be 2,000 pounds. But I am going to put a little note up in front of this. This is actually what's called one net or short ton. And that's normally what we use for ton. But since there is a net or a short ton, it implies that there is a gross or long ton. And there is. And again, this is not something you'll ever need to convert, so you don't need this number written down if you don't want to. But a long ton is 2,240 pounds. What the difference is, if you think of your paycheck, um, in your paycheck, if you work 40 hours a week, get paid $12 an hour, 40 times 12 is $480. Do you get $480? No. They take out all this other stuff, you might get like 350 bucks. That 350 is your net pay after they take all that other junk out. Well, that's the same thing here. Um, like I said, the ton was originally used for buying and selling grain. You cannot put 2,000 pounds of grain on a scale. It would slide off the sides. So they had to put it in a container. The container that held a ton of grain was about 240 pounds. So the gross ton was the grain with the container. The net ton was just the grain. For our purposes, like I said, 99.99999% of the time, you're looking at 2,000 pounds in a ton. Don't confuse that with something called a gross, by the way. Um, a gross is just an amount of items, not a weight or a mat, say anything like that. So we have the pounds that we put in here. So let's look at a pound. Now the first thing I should note is the abbreviation for pound is LB. Um, it would make sense to use PD for pound, but in the bookkeeping at that time for buying and selling grain, PD was already used as the abbreviation for paid. So you didn't want to confuse paid and pound. So they use LB, which comes from the Latin word libra, which is the Latin word for pound. Smaller than a pound, what's our next unit? Ounces. How many ounces are in a pound? 16 ounces in a pound. Good. So one pound contains 16 ounces. Now since they use the Latin word for pounds to abbreviate that, they use the Latin word for ounces to abbreviate that as well. So it's OZ. And I cannot remember what the Latin word is that, that that stands for right now. But anyway, units smaller than an ounce, we have drams. Drams sound metric, but they are not. They are part of the standard system. There are 16 drams in an ounce. A dram is one of our original apothecary units. Um, you might be prescribed an eighth of a dram of medication or a quarter of a dram of medication for painkillers. A dram, compared to milligrams and stuff like that, is still a relatively large unit. But anyway, that was one of our original apothecary units. Now, another unit that was very popular in medicine was the grain. The grain was defined as one pound equals seven 
thousand grains. Now the abbreviation for grain is GR, be very careful. Here's our abbreviation for gram is going to be G. So a lot of people, they see GR and they instantly think of grams. And that's one of the bigger mistakes I see on tests and, and working with, with grains is they see GR and you think grams right away. Of course, that messes things up. 7,000 grains in a pound. The grain was so embedded in medicine and medical applications for medications. A grain is literally a, a, like a piece of, uh, I don't remember exactly, I think, I believe it was wheat was what they used for grain. 7,000 grains of wheat. I can't remember, is it a wheat or barley? And I can't remember which one it is. Because there's actually two types of grains out there. There's a barley grain and a wheat grain. And I believe it was the wheat grain that was latched on and used for medicine. Um, so anyway, oops, hopefully that echo stops first. So anyway, that uh, grain was so embedded in medicine that they actually absorbed it into the metric system. It was not a clean absorption, as we'll see when we get into the metric system here. Anyway, then there's also something called minims. Minims kind of flow back and forth between weight and volume or capacity measurement. One dram contains 60 minims. Think of minims kind of like a minute. 60 minutes in an hour, 60 minims in a dram. This was also very popular for measuring out medications, generally for liquid medications, the minims. So those are our standard units of weight. Now, something I'll point out, not terribly important in the medical field, but, and again, this part's not going to be on a test ever, but you hear a lot on the news about gold reaching $1,700 an ounce or silver is up over $100 an ounce or whatever. When you hear those, when they're talking about precious metals, they are not talking about the same pounds and ounces that we're talking about here. Uh, we mentioned, you know, King Edward declaring that his thumb was going to be the official inch and his foot the official inch of the land. Well, that happened other places as well. Other kings, other rulers declared, you know, my thumb is going to be the official measurement and all that. So what happened is, you know, even though these are called standard measurements, they were, were far from standard. As you went from one region to the next, an inch was a different size, or a pound was actually a different size. Um, for the most part, what we use is, is what they used in the, the British Isles, northwestern Europe. Um, but there were units from southern Europe and others and eastern Europe that were different, that were very popular, used just as commonly as the units we use. Um, they talk about the imperial pound and stuff like that. Well, precious metals, the center for buying and trading precious metals was in the Met Mediterranean Sea on the island of Troy. So when we buy and sell precious metals, those are done with Troy measurements. And again, if you don't want to write these down, you don't have to. You'll never be tested on them. But one Troy pound is only about 0.82 regular pounds. So it's smaller than a regular pound. But one Troy pound only contains 12 troy ounces. So a troy ounce is actually slightly larger than our standard ounce. One of the reasons I bring this up is, like I said, because you hear a lot about precious metals being bought and sold. But when we get into our apothecary units, there are going to be spots where well, a fluid ounce and a fluid pound or fluid ounce and a fluid dram don't match up the way we thought they should. Well, that's because the fluid measurements that we use came from a different origin than what the weight measurements that we've adopted are. So anyway, let's look now at volume, capacity. Just like mass and weight, there is a difference between capacity and volume that most people don't realize. And really, all it is is the way it is measured. Volume is derived from lengths. 
So a volume, if I took a box shape, is found from measuring its length, its width, and its height, and multiplying those dimensions together. So if this is one inch by one inch by one inch, that gives us one inch cubed or cubic inch. That's volume. Capacity are the units that we're more used to using, like gallons. Now there is a conversion between cubic inches and gallons. Not a very clean one. One ga and actually a gallon originated from the size of a average man's hat. Now I'm not talking about like a cowboy hat. I'm talking about little derby hats that they wore in Europe. You got to remember a lot of these measurements originated in Europe before they ever came over to this continent. Um, the term ten gallon hat was just kind of the euphemism. Somebody was wearing a really big hat. That was the saying. Was oh, that's a ten gallon hat there. Um, it wasn't really holding ten gallons, obviously. So anyway, one gallon. Now notice I'm not putting an equal sign. I'm doing kind of a squiggle lines there. Is approximately 231 of these cubic inches. One inch by one inch by one inch cubes. It's just slightly off. It is really close. Now. Volume is also in cubic feet, which would be one foot by one foot by one foot. And we all know how big a foot is. Now, if you picture that, most of you have seen a five-gallon bucket. Would you say that a five-gallon bucket is more or less than a cubic foot? Or about equal? Most people would say really close to equal. You know, it's a little bit more than a foot tall. A lot of people say it's slightly more than a cubic foot. It's actually slightly, well, quite a bit less. One cubic foot is, depending on what textbook you're looking at, it's not four, I don't want that, either 7.5 or 7.48 gallons. So that usually surprises people, seven, almost 7.5 seven gallons in a cubic foot. So your five-gallon bucket's only about two-thirds of a cubic foot. So back to our units of capacity. So we can relate capacity to our volumes using the gallon, the cubic inches, cubic foot. Smaller than a gallon in our units of capacity, what do we have? Pints are smaller, but there's one in between. Quart, there you go. The word quart actually is derived from a quarter gallon, was the original term for it. So that implies that there are how many in a gallon? Four. Four quarts or four quarters in a gallon. Smaller than that, we do have the pint. One quart contains how many pints? Two pints. Now I should, the pint actually came from the size of a drinking cup. I mean, you get a pint of beer or whatever when you go into a saloon. It was a standard size of a cup. Um, when these things were, I should say a cup, a standard size of a glass, because a cup is slightly different. But anyway, when these things originally came out, there was no relationship between them. You know, a pound and an ounce, they were just different things that they used to compare things to. They didn't have any relationship to each other at all. There wasn't 16 ounces in a pound. There was not two pints in a quart. At some point, they decided, hey, it would be really nice if you happen to measure the capacity of something in quarts and I measure the capacity of something in pints. It would be really nice to be able to tell which one's bigger or smaller. So then they, they adjusted all these units to make it so that there was a conversion from one to the other. But originally, there was no conversion, no relationship between pints and quarts and any of our other units for that matter. Smaller than a pint, there's one in between there too, a cup. There are two cups in a pint. A cup actually comes from a cupped hand. That's about how much powder that you can contain in a cupped hand. Um, I've tried it. My hands are a little big, so I have slightly more than a cup. 
it is actually pretty close. Now a little warning that I'm going to put out here. Um, see, quarts and pints. Quart is abbreviated QT and pint is PT. And a lot of your type fonts, Qs look like that, Ps look like that. They're reverses of each other. So be careful when you're reading. Just slow down a little bit and read them because I see a lot of people mix that up. They'll see quart, read pint because of that letter. Smaller than a cup. Fluid ounces. How many fluid ounces are in a cup? Eight. Good. There are eight fluid ounces in a cup. Smaller than a fluid ounce, we have other units. The fluid ounce is abbreviated FLOZ. Now, one fluid ounce, you know, we, we hear about fluid ounces and ounces. The relationship is, is one fluid ounce is a size, not a weight. But it's the size, that the amount of space that's taken up by one ounce of water. So that is the link between weight and capacity for the, for the ounce, is that fluid ounce is one ounce of water. So something that is more dense than water, obviously one fluid ounce is going to weigh more than an ounce. Something less dense, it's not going to, going to weigh, weigh less than an ounce. Smaller than a fluid ounce, we have tablespoons. Anybody know how many tablespoons are in a fluid ounce? Marley, anybody know how many tablespoons are in a cup? That one is more popular. That part's good, yep. There are 16 tablespoons in a cup. So there's two tablespoons in a fluid ounce. Yeah, there's, there's 48 teaspoons in a cup. So there's two tablespoons in a fluid ounce, or 16 tablespoons in a cup. Now, smaller than a tablespoon, I'm going to use TBSP, capital TBSP, to abbreviate tablespoon. In just a second, I'll talk about other possible abbreviations for tablespoon. A teaspoon, as you said, there are three teaspoons in a tablespoon. Now, a little bit of a side note here. Tablespoon, I abbreviate it with a capital T, BSP, but it can be abbreviated with a small t, BSP, or it can be abbreviated with a capital T, SP, or just with a capital T. Those are all acceptable abbreviations for tablespoon. I use this one because it's the most exaggerated, because it has the capital T and it has the B in it. Teaspoon is abbreviated using either small t, SP, or just small t. But you can see here, TSP and TSP is just a capital T or the small t. Or just T and T is a capital T or small t. You have to be very careful of those abbreviations. They can be very fuzzy. Um, the one that seems to be most common now is just capital T and small t, because that seems to be more clear. Um, the TSP for tablespoon gets to be the one that catches you the most. you got to be careful. Um, trust me, because I have screwed this one up before. If your chocolate chip cookies call for three teaspoons of salt and you screw up, there is no amount of milk you can drink to choke those things down if you get three tablespoons of salt in there. Just saying. What's that? No, the dough was not even, no. Not. Oh, I, I did, but I, I had cookies in the oven and I started eating dough. It's like, oh, this is horrible. And I'm sitting there with that decision. Okay, so now do I mix up? Since I got, it is three times as much salt, do I mix up two more batches of cookie dough and mix them together? Or what do I do? I end up just throwing it out. Is it? That may have been laziness may have taken over at that point. It's like, I'll just give up. Um, you don't need to write these next ones down, but there are units smaller than teaspoons that we hear. We're not going to use them for the class, but that we hear about um, one teaspoon contains two dashes, one dash contains three smidgens, and one smidgen, oops, I did that wrong, not, not smidgens, it's three pinches 
One dash contains three pinches. And one pinch contains two smidgens. You know, I did too for a lot of years. A pinch of this, whatever. I thought it was just a, a slang term. They actually are measurements. A dash is from a spice shaker. You know, the and I'm not talking like a salt shaker, you know, they're the big spice shakers with bigger holes. Literally just one one tip of the shaker, one dash of the shaker was how much came out. That was a dash. A pinch, usually dealing with a powder, like flour or sugar or whatever. You just reach in your fingers and pinched and threw it in. That was a pinch. The smidgen always kind of eh, grossed me out just a little bit. It was just you stuck your finger in the powder and whatever stuck to your finger. You flicked off in. So the cook with sweaty fingers, you know, uh, I'm just saying, you know. So anyway, um, those measurements are actual measurements. Uh, I always throw them out there just because it's kind of neat to see that they, they are real. I had kind of never thought about them much. We do have other measurements out there. Um, we have fluid drams. The fluid dram, however, does not relate to the fluid ounce in the same way that a weight dram does. One fluid ounce contains eight fluid drams. So I, I hate throwing that one out there because it confuses people. Now in fluid measure, we don't use the fluid dram hardly at all, so it's not worth remembering that much. And please don't let it mess up your, your uh, memory of the dram, 16 drams in an ounce for weight. So that one is kind of a, a bad one to put out there. Okay, now let's talk about a little bit of converting with these before we get to our metrics. If I want to convert from, let's say, pounds into ounces, if I have something that is four pounds and I need to convert it into ounces, if you recall back with fractions, if I had three-fourths of a three-fourths as a fraction and I needed to rename it, one of the things I did was I could multiply by three on top and bottom. Or I could multiply by anything else on top and bottom, right? If I'm multiplying by three over three, what is the value of this that I'm multiplying by? One. Three over three is one. And when I multiply by one, it doesn't change the value. It gives me back the exact same value. But it can change the appearance. Here for our fraction, it made this 9 over 12 now instead of 3 over 4. It's still the exact same value. It just looks different. We're going to do the same thing with our measurements. We're going to take our 4 pounds. I always underline my pounds when I write pound, LB as my abbreviation. The reason I do that is this. Is that 51B or 5 pounds? Well, I put a line under it. Now it's obvious that that is 5 pounds. It's not something that's required. It's something that when I was in a, some of my engineering classes as well. You also see I put the little line through my 7s and Zs and all that. I had a lot of people very uptight about notation in my engineering classes, so I, I got used to doing all those little things. For those of you sitting at home wondering why on earth is he always underlining LB? You no, know, just because I'm uptight and weird. We're going to make it a fraction by putting it over 1. Now you might be thinking, how on earth does something get easier by making it a fraction? Well, now it allows us to convert. We're going to use a conversion factor. And this actually is kind of a little bit of foreshadowing to our dimensional analysis. This is going to be a huge part of our unit 3 on our dosage calculations. And dimensional analysis is also a big tool for our measurement conversions. We're going to look at dimensional analysis all on its own here, actually, by the end of the hour today. But what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this by a conversion factor. And our conversion factor is going to be like this. This is what we call the unity fraction because it has a value of 1. 3 over 3 equals 1. Well, we're going to put, uh, make it create a fraction here that has a value of 1 as well. The numerator and the denominator will have the same value. It's just going to look a little different than 3 over 3. I'm getting rid of pounds, so I know that if I put something with the label of pounds down here, 
it's going to cross cancel in my fractions. I can cross cancel the pounds out. So that would mean there's no units here. What units do I want to go to here? Do I want to convert to? Ounces, right? So whatever I'm going to put on top here is going to be ounces. So now what's the numerator has to equal the denominator. I know that one pound equals 16 ounces. So I'm going to put one pound on bottom and 16 ounces on top. That does not look like a unity fraction. It doesn't look like it equals one, but it does. Because 16 ounces and one pound are the same thing, same size. So like I said, the pounds can cancel out. I have four times 16 ounces is 64 ounces. And on bottom, one times one is one. So that's just 64 ounces. If I use something like... Oh, I don't know. Eight cups. And I want to convert it into quarts. Take my eight cups, put it over one to make it a fraction. In my conversion factor, I'm going to put cups on bottom. Do I have a direct equivalency from cups to quarts? No, I don't. From cups, I can either go down to fluid ounces or I can go up to pints. So I'm put pints here. What's my relationship between pints and cups? One pint equals two cups. Okay? So at this point, the cups can cross cancel out and I'm in pints. But I don't want pints, I want quarts. So I'm going to use another conversion factor here and I'm going to put pints on bottom. So now the pints will cancel out. Is there a direct relationship from pints to quarts? Yes, there is. One quart equals two pints. So now the pints have cross-canceled out as well. On top, I'm going to multiply. I have eight times one times one quart is eight quarts. On bottom, one times two times two is just four. So now I divide that out. 8 quarts divided by 4 is 2 quarts. So 4 cups is equivalent to 2 quarts. So before we go any further, let's take a look at our metric units. In our metric system, there is only one main unit, or only one unit for each type of measurement. For capacity, that unit is a liter. Sometimes you'll see this spelled like this, L-I-T-R-E. I was always taught that leader had to be abbreviated with a capital L. The reason for that was be, had nothing to do with math. It was because I learned the metric system in the late 80s, and at that time we didn't have as many type fonts as we do now. On a lot of your typewriters and the early computers, a 1 and a small l were identical. In fact, it went way back before my time, some of the very first typewriters in the 40s and 50s, um, you didn't even have a one key on it. You just used a small L for one. So it was tough to distinguish. So if I had this, is that 21 or is that two liters? Well, if I use a capital L for liters, now it's obvious that that's two liters. So it was clear. Now with all of our different type fonts that we have, it is acceptable to use a small L to abbreviate liters. So in your textbook, you're going to see them use a small L in class because, well, I'm stuck in my ways. You're probably going to see me use a capital L almost every time, so just know that it doesn't matter anymore. For mass, now remember we talked about in standard units, we tend to measure weight. In metric units, we tend to measure mass. The main unit of mass is a gram. A gram is a large paper clip, actually just slightly more than a large paper clip. Seems pretty small, but we, we make it work. 
There is a weight unit. We're not going to use it in here, but the weight unit is a Newton. That's the last time you hear that term, probably. And then, of course, length. Unit of length is a meter. Now, when they created the metric system, they, we had been using standard measurement for literally hundreds of years, if not a couple thousands of years. Now, the metric system, by the way, was actually developed in late 1800s, late 1880s, I believe, 1880s or early 1890s. So it's been around for about 130 years right now. I mean, it's not like brand new like most people think. But the metric system is new compared to um, what we've, we've, we've been using for our standard units. The standard units were never planned out. They just, like we said, they developed out of necessity. And after they were being used for literally hundreds of years, then they finally decided, well, let's make a measurement system instead of all these independent units. So like I said, they, they decided, well, let's, it'd be nice to be able to convert from inches to feet. If you measure that table in inches and I measure a different table in feet, we have no way of telling which one's longer. So they adjusted the sizes so they fit together. And that's why we have all those weird conversions, like one foot is 12 inches and one yard is three feet. One pound is 16 ounces. It's because those units were never designed to be put together. They, they were forced to work together because we needed, to, we decided it was more desirable to have a system where they did work together. So in the metric system, they were able to look back at how we had used those standard units and all the weaknesses and all the problems we had with those standard units and design around it. So in the metric system, they designed it so there were nice, neat conversions from one unit to the next. Um, in our standard units, we saw one gallon was 231 cubic inches. In the metric system, they made a when they defined the units of capacity, they made them be specific sizes so there's a neat conversion between our lengths and our capacities. So it's time for a break. So when we come back, we'll actually look at the, the units and conversions within the metric system. So let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. We'll be back about 11.31 or so.